Bonjour à toutes et à tous et merci à Florian de m'avoir invité à faire cette présentation aujourd'hui. Tout d'abord, je m'excuse de faire la présentation en anglais, mais comme Florian le sait bien, mon français n'est pas très courant. Alors, je vais commencer. I'm currently Professor Emerita in Sport and Physical Cultures at the University of Lincoln in England, although the research programme about which I will be talking today actually commenced prior to joining Lincoln and comprises a number of different separate projects which I shall describe in a moment. So today I shall be discussing experiences of asthma in sports and exercise contexts using a theoretical framework that combines sociology and phenomenology, a, a framework I found to be very productive in this and also other projects. And I shall be focusing on three key themes today. That's asthma and disease, what's termed dis-ease, bodily attunement and breathing work, somatic learning and empathy. So the research program actually comprises three separate distinct projects on asthma in non-elite sports people. And all of these took place, I should stress, pre-pandemic, pre the COVID-19 pandemic. The first was a three-year research study, as you'll see there, which incorporated a PhD studentship undertaken by Dr. Helen Outen. The second project was a three-year plus, indeed is ongoing, Um, autoethnography of women's distance running, including cross-country running and ultra-trail running. And then finally, a one-year funded project undertaken at the University of Lincoln and the Open University in the UK. And this latter um, involved 19 qualitative interviews, including eight vignette-based elicitations, whereas interviewers, we used short stories but which drew on actual data in order to engage our interviewees in conversations. So my particular form of sociological phenomenology or phenomenological sociology draws strongly on Husserl's modern phenomenology as the study of phenomena or things as they appear to us in our conscious mind. So for Husserl, the his method involved the suspension as far as possible or the bracketing apoche i'm not sure how that's pronounced in french perhaps epoche of the natural attitude and this attitude is our everyday ways of being in the world including our tacit and taken for granted assumptions surrounding a phenomenon or phenomena So phenomenology and sociology actually share a common goal and this is challenging the taken for grantedness of everyday life and efforts, our best efforts, to uncover the assumptions and presuppositions that often remain unacknowledged and under-analyzed in our everyday worlds. But they also differ. Whereas phenomenology seeks to identify universal and invariant structures of experience that don't change over time or culture, empirical forms of sociology and anthropology generally research the very particular, the specificities of experience according to historical epoch, for example, and social structural specificities such as gender, socioeconomic class. So they have similarities, sociology and phenomenology, but they also have distinct differences. In terms then of the linkage between existential phenomenology and sociology, I think this is a very powerful theoretical linkage. And it was developed in North American sociology by Alfred Schutz initially. And the particular form of sociological phenomenology I employ myself Um, as I've described elsewhere, this highlights the structurally, politically and ideologically influenced and the historically specific, socially situated nature of our human embodiment and experience. So I want very strongly to acknowledge and take account of gender, age, ethnicity, degrees of ability or disability, 
for example, and there's a paper um, to which I refer there um, from 2011. And I'd argue that particularly opposite for the sociology of sport and of exercise is Merleau-Ponty's focus on the centrality of our body in our being in the world. So for him and for those who follow it in his footsteps in many ways, our body is what anchors us in the world. It is the point of all sensory perception from what from which we perceive, from which we experience um, our lives and our life worlds. I'm also very interested in Drew Lader's work, uh, which you may have come across, and his conceptualization of what he terms bodily disappearance. Um, dis signifying um, bad or abnormal. So for later, when we're in a kind of normal, healthy state, the body disappears in the normal sense of disappearing, in that it does not appear to us, but it's background. It's in the background of our consciousness. We're not really aware of our body unless something brings it to our attention. So whilst we're not actively attending to, thinking about, reflecting on the body, we most likely are attending from it, going outwards into the world. So Lady uses the example of a climber who attends or pays attention via her or his legs and feet to the ground beneath, to the rock, the feeling of the rock, the feeling of the um, soil or of the ice and snow. So using her or his legs to feel the way in the world, but not really particularly paying attention to legs and feet. And then in contrast, very differently, when the body disappears with the dis prefix, um, perhaps from illness or injury or fatigue, discomfort, then the body becomes a thematic focus of our intention, intentionality. We're conscious of it, we're thinking about it. it, it strikes our consciousness. So going on to talk about asthma itself, um, asthma is deemed a breathing disorder where the inflammation of the, the lungs and the airways in general affects our pulmonary ventilation. And there are lots of different symptoms for example, coughing, wheezing, breathlessness, and these vary across different sufferers. So according to Asthma UK, which is a charity based here in the UK, there are 5.4 million people currently receiving treatment for asthma. So you'll see there's 1.1 million children included in that. Every 10 seconds, someone is having a potentially life-threatening asthma attack. So although sometimes asthma is thought to be a relatively minor disorder, it can indeed be life-threatening, so it can be very serious. Indeed, so serious that on average three people in the UK die from an asthma attack every day. Um, there are also people who have what's termed severe asthma, and this doesn't respond to standard treatments and may require hospitalisation, sometimes for extended periods, in order to allow the person to recover their breathing. And the most recent data we have available in the UK are from 2017, and as you can see from that, almost 1,500 people in the UK died. And a recent um, survey undertaken by Asthma UK ask people to tell um, the surveyors in one word how they felt about having an asthma attack or indeed witnessing somebody else have an asthma attack. And these were the key terms as you'll see, panic, terrified, scared, all these kind of feelings were very strong in those having an asthma attack or witnessing one. So in terms of asthma in sport, Exercise-induced asthma, EAI, or bronchoconstriction, the tightening of the bronchial tubes, occurs in around 80 to 90% of asthmatics. So exercise and physical activity have a kind of double side, a dual aspect, in that moderate or intense physical activity tends to provoke bronchoconstriction, therefore can bring on asthma attacks. But on the other hand, 
regular physical activity has both physical and psychosocial benefits in that it strengthens the lungs and indeed the whole of the cardiovascular system. So at the time of undertaking this um, programme of research projects, there was a real dearth, a real lack of qualitative research on the lived experience of asthma in sports participants and or those people who were committed and regular exercises. So we were very interested in finding out what the key structures of experience were in terms of having asthma and engaging in sporting um, and exercise domains. So our key findings um, are going to be described now. The first of which, and this emerged very strongly from the project, was that asthma gave rise to dis-ease in Leda's terms. So to remind you, Leda says that in our normal healthy state, um, we take our body for granted and our body is marked by relative ease of being. So there's a lack of self-reflection and self-awareness focused on the body. The body is in the background. It's absent in Leda's terms. It's not the focus of our thinking, of our intentionality. So the body dis disappears from the forefront of our minds. However, when our everyday bodily routines are interrupted, for example, by pain or injury or illness, but also, as I and a colleague have described, by feelings of intense embodiment, which can be pleasurable and other strong sensations, when this happens, our body breaks into our consciousness and so it dis, the D-Y-S appears as in the dis um, prefix meaning bad or abnormal. And for asthma sufferers, most often it is indeed displeasure that is generated when the asthmatic body is brought to mind so strongly. So when breathing becomes difficult, we are aware of being a body. We're aware of having lungs and the difficulties of our breathing. And these things are normally in the background. They're not something that we're consciously aware of doing. So here's a field note from the autoethnographic project I described earlier. I'll read this. The heavy pollen thick air sticks to my throat. It feels as if only a third of my lungs can fill with air. Even taking the air down my throat is difficult. My rib cage expands heavily with the effort of sucking in the humid air. There's a brief respite with a light, clean-cut pungency of pine tree and evergreen hedge before I'm accosted by the drowsy richness of dark, rain-sodden roses as I run past neatly trimmed gardens on the edge of the park chest heavy and labouring with the effort to breathe in and even more with the effort to breathe out which is often the case for asthma sufferers. Even my sports bra feels heavy digging into my ribs as I as into my heaving ribs as I ascend the slight slope. So I hope that gives a feel for the difficulty of breathing particularly the effort to breathe out to expel air from the lungs. But for those who suffer from more severe asthma um, and asthma attacks, the very unpredictability, the onslaught of asthma upon the body generated feelings of panic for our participants. A kind of a thrownness, as Heidegger would say, of being caught out, taken by surprise by one's own body. And for a lot of people, this meant being reliant upon their inhaler in order to calm down the symptoms. So Lucy, who was a young uh, swimmer, said, it just feels like I can't, I can't get the air in. And that's the main uncomfortableness of it. But then it's like the panic side of things as well. It's that I'm not getting the air in at the moment. I can't sort of get enough air to make me feel good. You know, when you feel satisfied and you have a deep breath, I can't sort of get that. And that's what makes me feel uncomfortable. And then it's obviously like, oh God, I'm not breathing. This isn't working. That yeah, that mainly physiological, but also panic, the panic side. And as um, an an older one of our participants, uh, who was a former ballet dancer, again stressed this panicky side. So it's not very nice. Your chest just doesn't get bring the air in. It's 
it's a bit scary but then you take your blue inhaler and it's all right so again the reliance on an external object the inhaler to put things right and as a male participant Ivor very evocatively described to the interviewer his black zone um, when an asthma episode would develop into a severe life-threatening even attack je vous laisse à lire uh, ces mots de Ivor So he's stressing there how scary it is, even more scary than dangling off a cliff or being in a car accident. So it's scary, scary, scary. And that's, those are comments from Ivor, who was in his 40s at the time of the interview, a golf player and also a climber. So the panicky scariness of asthma attacks emerging there from our participants. Then the second element that emerged very strongly from our data was how asthma, people with asthma, can become very attuned to breathing and their, their breathing work. So, for example, um, I and, and my colleague Helen Outen wrote about how asthmatic people can become very attuned via deep listening, that's paying careful, analytic almost, auditory attention to their bodies and their me and their the sounds produced by their bodies with asthma so for many asthmatics noisy heavy breathing wheezing coughing and spluttering are all kind of signals strong signals um, of, of the asthma body the suffering asthma body and as Vanini and colleagues have termed this these are non-symbolic sonorous expressions so they're not vo vocabulary they're not um, words they're non-symbolic but nevertheless they convey a lot to us so people with asthma um, pay attention they listen to their bodies and they often come to anticipate and to monitor carefully their symptoms and in general, sports people and committed exercisers often do become very aware of, very attuned to their own breathing and also the breathing of others. For example, in running races, um, you become very attuned to how the competitors around you are breathing and, of course, to your own breathing patterns. And we also found... Um, that people with asthma are very highly motivated to manage their asthma, to seek to manage and to control, at least to some extent, as much as possible, their um, asthma symptoms and um, the relationship with their, their body. And I think this resonates strongly with Arthur Frank's work on what he terms the disciplined body, the body that is that we seek to control as much as possible. So there's often a very fine bodily attunement to even tiny, tiny changes in our body and body world relationship, centering on the lungs, for example. So as Eve, who was in her 20s, a footballer, a cyclist and a swimmer said, when I'm doing sport, you're constantly aware of, you know, the way you're breathing and the air, your mouth and nose feel like they're covered in cling film or like a carrier bag and you've got a few tiny pinpricks in which to let the air in. So a very kind of evocative description from Eve about the struggles to breathe in, like having a, a bag, a plastic bag over your head. And another theme, another um, data section from the autoethnography um, where here I am saying that I can by now detect the exact moment that signals when my breathing will tip into wheezing and asthma, or rather to be precise, the exact exhalation, so the exact outward breath. There's something about the quality of that outward breath that alerts me to an imminent bout, a tightening of throat and upper thorax, a tight squeak on exhalation, and I know at that point I have to act. It's difficult to describe exactly, but I've learned how to steady my breath, to drop the pace, just fractionally even, 
to think calm, reduce the friction in my intake of breath and relax the small depressed area between my clavicles. So a very specific moment there being identified when um, difficulties in breathing can tip into, can go forward into wheezing and asthma. And then to consider the final third theme I'm going to look at today, and that's what um, I've termed somatic learning and empathy, bodily empathy particular. So with the benefit of experience and developing this attunement, this quite often very refined attunement to the body's reactions to asthma, some of our participants recounted how they'd learned to expe expect and to predict, at least to some extent, their bodily reactions to asthma and difficulties in breathing. And for them, this gave them some feeling of being more in control. So Betty, who's a, met a marathon runner in her 30s, says, I'd start the run and within five minutes, I'd notice that my breathing's a bit restricted. But then after about half an hour or 25 minutes, it goes away. Having said that, of course, half an hour or 25 minutes of uh, being having a, a feeling of restricted breathing is quite a long time when you're running. 30 minutes is quite a long time to be struggling with your breathing. But then Betty has learned that over time, then the difficulties, the restricted breathing will to some extent ease and she can, she can continue the run. And then Nick, who is a runner as well, and also a martial artist says, I can think of when asthma was a real nightmare. Loads of times when I've been running with X, a friend, and going, whoa, I'm really wheezing here at the end. I'd be going heavy wheezy noise, wheezing noises, waiting for it to calm down, but knowing that that's what you do. And then he's describing the struggle of, of him and his runner. We're both struggling hard, trying to beat each other, lungs burst, legs bursting, everything's bursting. So a very evocative description from Nick there about how it feels when asthma is such a nightmare. And as I mentioned earlier, we also undertook eight interviews with our participants where we used short sections, creative stories, which were based on earlier data, so generated from some of our earlier data to elicit comments from interviewees. So we wanted our interviewees to reflect on the stories, the vignettes that we were um, uh, letting them read and then give us their thoughts on these stories which recounted other people's asthma experiences. And when we came to look over the data from these interviews, there was a really strong corporeal or somatic element to participants, the empathy that they expressed for the people in the stories. And a lot of them said that they felt real benefits from reading about other people's um, asthma experiences. So Ian said to us, the fickle nature of asthma, the condition, comes across. This was in the stories. One of the things that is very difficult to manage is the symptoms can arise when you're not expecting it. So he found that that really resonated with his own experiences. And then Sally said, again about having read the vignette, the vignettes. The breathing, it's interesting, quite a few of them emphasize breathing slow and breathing deep. And certainly that's something I think of when I'm running. So there's real kind of somatic resonance when the interviewees come to look at the stories to read and to get a feel for other people's experiences. And, um, some of them suggested very strongly to us that these stories should be shared with medical professionals as these health care workers professionals could then benefit from hearing about what it actually feels like to be a person with asthma, which of course they may not know from their own experiences. And Diane here is saying that this could really help health care professionals um, inform their practice and inform the treatments that they prescribe. And at other conferences and symposia, medical practitioners themselves have said to us how powerful they found these 
stories of asthma, how powerful they found the actual lived experiences of asthma. So to finish off then, why did we use sociological phenomenology or indeed phenomenological sociology to um, theorise people's lived experience of asthma? Personally, I find this particularly particular um, disciplinary and also theoretical combination um, very powerful in exploring, in analysing embodiment, including sensory experiences. For example, the somatic empathy just described, where people get a real feel for other people's lived experiences, and I think that that's very a very powerful offering that sociological phenomenology can give us. Um, Apoche or bracketing encourages us to fundamentally question our tacit or taken for granted assumptions about a phenomenon or about phenomena. Um, but as I highlighted earlier, um, commensurate with sociology, there's a strong caveat that apoche can only ever be partial. It can never be complete. We can never stand completely outside of our own linguistic framework for example um, so as a sociologist the limitations of philosophical phenomenology include this drive this this goal to have to to be able to portray universal experience for me that there isn't universal experience or that is highly problematic because of sort of some of the key differences wrought by gender age, ethnicity, degrees of ability and disability, for example. These are fundamental to our lived experience, I would argue. And one of the powerful aspects of sociological phenomenology is that it acknowledges um, and it explores this huge impact of social structure, for example, of historical epoch, of our socio-cultural context, of our sporting context upon lived body experience. I've just mentioned previously about the possibilities of applying this, applying the findings from um, these kind of studies so that healthcare professionals and others, for example, sports coaches and team managers are encouraged to really listen to and to respect and to try to understand the insider perspective, what it actually feels like to experience asthma. And this can then help enhance understanding and have an impact upon the kinds of treatment that are offered to people with asthma who undertake sport, and more generally, people with asthma. And as people with asthma have often developed their own very high degree of attunement to specific bodily signals, I think it's very important to acknowledge this um, when healthcare practitioners are devising practical tr practical treatments for asthma that that fit with the context of the person with asthma so fit with their life world and aren't imposed unrealistically or impractically upon them merci thank you very much for listening to this if you would like to follow up on any of the articles you can find me at these various um, places do feel free to um to email me and my apologies for not being able to actually join you today due to circumstances but I'm very happy to answer questions um, subsequently via email for example or if you want to send these through Florian perhaps and I'll just leave you with the bibliography but thank you again for the opportunity. Merci bien.